Dysuria in women is a super, super common chief complaint in primary care. So in this video, I will be talking about the top differential diagnoses, including some sneaky ones that you might not remember or might not think of. Uh, I also am going to be talking about the important history questions when it comes to dysuria specifically, to not forget to ask those. And then I'm also going to be talking about treatment, to treat, to not treat, to send out cultures, to not, which antibiotics to use, that whole thing. So if you're new here, I'm Liz Rohr from Real World NP, and you're watching NP Practice made simple. The weekly videos to help save you time, frustration, and help you learn faster so you can take the best care of your patients. So two important notes, three important notes. One, I'm talking about dysuria in women. Number two is that I have a cheat sheet down below this video with all the kind of notes from this whole talk. So definitely pause, download that, and follow along. Print it out, keep it at your desk. And then three, the lab interpretation crash course for new nurse practitioners is coming out this month. As you can tell, I'm super excited. I'm obsessed with it. It's all the labs in primary care. And it's especially relevant for this topic because I go really deep into your analysis and feeling super confident with ordering them and interpreting them. So if you want to join us for that, head over to realworldnp.com slash labs and you can get on the interest list and then you'll get some emails when it opens up for enrollment. So jumping right in, the top differential diagnosis for dysuria in women, again, because men is a different story, but for women, the top thing that you think about probably is a urine tract infection, which most likely it is. It's pretty, pretty common in primary care. The other thing to, the kind of red flags to not forget about though, when especially if you're thinking that it's a UTI, you always want to make sure it's not pyelonephritis. It hasn't migrated all the way up to the kidneys, right? A couple other red flags that you, uh, that are a little bit sneaky, pelvic inflammatory disease and vaginitis. And so most of the time when patients come in, they complain of uh, burning when they pee, and it might be in the front of your mind that, to go down the urinary path, but it's very easily a vaginal sore. And so you want to think about uh, those types of history questions to ask. And pelvic inflammatory disease, less likely to present with dysuria, but just on the back of your mind to be thinking about and making sure that you're asking those types of questions. So uh, two, two to three other kind of sneaky ones. One is dehydration, right? And so I always ask about that in, in my history questions, especially if the urinalysis is coming up as nothing nothing special, and it doesn't really seem classic, and it's just kind of here and there. Um, I always ask about hydration status, because sometimes people aren't drinking anything all day, and then they have this like irritation when they pee, which makes sense because it's very concentrated. Uh, two other ones, one is ca uh, called interstitial cystitis. If you haven't heard of that one before, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, and it basically just means the bladder gets really irritated and it gets painful. And those are the types of people where they have recurrent symptoms that aren't going away, that aren't presenting as an infectious source. Again, a diagnosis of exclusion and, and you kind of are targeting what is causing the symptoms like acidic foods and coffee, tea and things like that and trying to eliminate them. I don't wanna to get too much into that, but just knowing that that's an option. And then the last kind of sneaky one is um, atrophic vaginitis. And so, especially in geriatric adults, when you have somebody who's gone through menopause, it's been a couple of years, they have atrophic vaginitis, the urethra can also get irritated. And so that is most common when I see my geriatric patients where they have recurrent dysuria and everything is coming up normal when you do a workup and it doesn't seem like it's an infectious source or anything like that. And when you treat the atrophic vaginitis, um, usually, with, usually with topical uh, hormone treatment, uh, it tends to improve the dysuria symptoms as well. So important history questions. I always take the same approach when it comes to my uh, acute visits and I recommend that you do the same. Just pick a system that works for you. So I use old cards, so onset, location, duration, et cetera, et cetera. And then asking all of the review of systems questions that are relevant to that system. So genitourinary, uh, vaginal symptoms, abdominal symptoms, things like that. What are the things that are around there? And if you don't know what history questions to ask, just ask all of them and it's totally fine. No worries. But specific ones that I wanted to mention, and I'm looking down because I have my notes here, and I've mentioned this a couple of different times, but as you progress in your practice and you have those differentials in the front of your mind, as you come into a visit, you can work your history backwards by keeping those in the front of your mind, right? So if you're thinking it's a UTA or pyelonephritis, what are the things that would present with that, right? So abdominal pain, fever, chills, vomiting, new back pain, um, hematuria, dysuria frequency, things like that, asking all of those questions, versus do they have a vaginal source? Do they have discharge, odor, dyspareunia? Do they have itching? And then the two other really important ones for dysuria is how many have they had in the last year or have they had this before? Always ask if they had this before. I recommend that because when I haven't asked that and I've gone through this whole 20 minute questioning, answering this whole path, and 
they could have just, if I had only asked that, they could have told me the whole thing and I wouldn't have to spend all that time and go down that path asking all of those questions. They would have just volunteered it. So always ask if they've had this before, but how many they've had? Because if it's a recurrent UTI, that's very different than if it's the first time they've ever had one or the last one that they had was a year ago. Because if they have recurrent UTIs, they might need a different treatment, not only today, but also in the future of what, what are we going to do for them? The other one to really ask, and I always ask this, but it's especially relevant for dysuria, what have they tried? What have they taken for it? Because if they take an over-the-counter dysuria supplement, there's like a cranberry or, or other things, I don't want to use brand names, but um, people tend to use those over-the-counter and that can contaminate or alter the results of your urinalysis and your, your urine dip. And so making sure that you always are asking that. So treatment. So does it seem like they have a really classic UTI, right? They have frequency, urgency, no hematuria. It started yesterday. They have no vaginal symptoms. They've had this before. It feels the exact same. Like, okay, they probably have a UTI. So if you're deciding about treatment, you can do a couple of things. So one is if you're in the clinic, you can do a urinalysis and a dipstick or urine dipstick at least to start and considering sending out a urinalysis. Again, I go into this in the lab interpretation crash course, like the full thing of how to interpret all of those. But if it seems like they have a UTI based on the dip, you can empirically treat them versus sending out for a culture and then treating them based off the culture. The things to think about when it comes to that are, do they have any uh, comorbidities? Do they have any reasons why you would consider reasons to think that they might have resistance? Like, do they live in a skilled nursing facility? Were they recently hospitalized? Did they recently take antibiotics? Do they have other medical comorbidities happening versus if they are a healthy 20 year old woman who comes in and just has this, right? And so for those patients, you can empirically treat them with the first line agents without sending out a culture. But again, this is also practice uh, preference, right? And if you're a brand new grad, you're probably going to want to test everybody and that's totally normal. That's totally fine. Um, however, if they're somebody who has risk factors for resistance, you always want to send out uh, that urine culture to make sure that you're treating them with the right antibiotic. So first line treatment, there's there's kind of two main options that I typically see in primary care. One is nitrofurantoin, and hopefully I'm saying that right. I have a hard time pronouncing things. Uh, that is specific to cystitis though. That is not to be used for renal infections. And so if you feel like it's a simple cystitis, it's just contained to the bladder, you can use nitrofurantoin. Again, it's on the cheat sheet, all that stuff. Hopefully I'm saying that right. And then the other one is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, which has a brand name that's easier to say when I'm trying not to use brand names. Also on the cheat sheet. And the uh, nitrofurantoin is twice a day for five days. And then the other one is twice a day for three days. If it's an uncomplicated first presentation, don't have any risk factors for resistance, three days and that's it. And depending on your comfort level and their risk factors, do you wanna send it out for culture? And so if you treat somebody, they're not getting better, then you definitely do wanna have them come in, give a urine sample, and then send it out for culture. In terms of telemedicine, there's different levels of comfort there as well. And so for, for me personally as a clinician, if I have somebody with zero risk factors, has never had uh, a UTI before, it, doesn't, it sounds very classic UTI, I'm comfortable treating them over the phone. Whereas if they have any risk factors, they're older adults, things like that, then I might be more likely to have them in some way drop off a urine sample so that we can test it and then possibly culture it if we need to. And then I always wrap up my, my dysuria visits, especially if I've diagnosed a UTI, um, by discussing uh, urination before and after intercourse, um, especially after, but um, before if they're getting these more often. Uh, talking about pantyliner use and not necessarily associated with UTI as much as like a vaginitis, but daily, you know, daily pantyliner use can be irritating in that general area. Always wiping from front to back. You might think that that's really simple and everybody knows that, but they really don't because the more, the, when I was a brand new grad and I started to say that more and more, I felt really stupid because Obviously people know that, but they don't, they really don't. And it's like revolutionary for some people. So definitely make sure that you're talking about that. So let me know if you have any questions. That's all I have to say for today. Don't forget to head over to realworldnp.com slash labs. If you want to check out the lab interpretation crash course for new nurse practitioners, it's really the best. And then also you can grab your cheat sheet down below this video. Thank you so much for watching. Hang in there and I'll see you soon.